J. Marvin Herndon, nuclearworld.com, on George Nori, Coast to Coast AM, 12, 14, 17. Weather control, weather control. created by all of the spraying. Uh, 
contrails is, the, is one of the big lies. Now, as people are beginning to see through that, they're trying to say that it's 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 other particles that are put out of commercial jet engines and things like that. But but all of this is a lie. Uh, this uh, this is a uh, deliberate uh, spraying activity. Let's go to Linda in South Carolina. First time caller for us. Good morning, Linda. Hi, how are you doing tonight? Okay, thanks. Um, I agree with what's being said here because I was in the military and I learned a lot of scary things, but three things that really stick out in my mind. If you ever see a low flying plane with some kind of smoke or exhaust coming out of the back of it, take cover. Right. Number one. Yeah. Number two, if you're in the military, you're a property of the government, so they can do whatever they want to with you. Except what I did as an experiment. 
experiment some years ago. I was making iron sulfide by precipitating it as a liquid. Yes, and man. I filtered it. it was very highly powered. I filtered it. And as it dried, it started burning. Radio it ignited. Fine powders do that. You, you, you know about the, the explosions and, and the silos that contain the flour. Flour and wheat and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. They blow up. It's like a bomb. And so, I mean, they've been setting the stage for this fire. And, uh, you know, sadly, a firefighter was killed today. Yeah. Uh, uh, leaving a wife, a pregnant wife, and a, and a two-year-old child. And a true hero. And a true hero. And, and this is this is barbarian. This is the, this is the deep state. And uh, this is this is what uh, uh, this is. I think all put into place during uh, Barack Obama's administration. Or be, or even before, Marv. Well, the military was doing this all the way back to to. report uh, of uh, uh, one day in, in Palm Springs where the, these trails were across the sky and just were there all day long. Right. Is, isn't it possible that presidents have no idea what's going on? That they're just not told? No. Oh, I, I'm sure that, well, the one thing about secret programs is that uh, they're secret. They're secret. And, and there's a need to know and there's compartmentalization. And most people who are involved in this activity have no idea the health risks and the damage that's being done. We've always felt uh, with the UFO field that presidents uh, on a need-to-know basis, and most of them aren't on that need-to-know basis. They're not told anything. Well, there's a... Uh, well, as, as has been coming out recently, uh, there's 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 a lot of deep state activity in in the in the central part of the government. Let's go to the phones again. East of the Rockies, my neck of the woods. Tom in St. Louis. Hey, Tom, go ahead. Uh, how you doing, George? Great. Now this isn't just me and it's not just drugs. This is an entire emerging industry of programmable nanotechnology. Since it started around 2000, it's really growing exponentially. The number, by any measurement, number of papers, number of participants. I've had the great pleasure of working with students over the last decade at a program called iGEM that was started at MIT and based on US First, the International Robotics Program. And I absolutely love working with these kids. These are kids that have never been in a lab before, they've grown up digital, and they do work that is PhD worthy. 
by working in small teams and using these incredibly powerful genetic engineering tools that large pharma companies would have just done anything for a couple of decades ago. It's, it's a real phase shift in biotechnology. We're starting to see an industry blossom. CB Insights tallied them up a few weeks ago. It's over 60 different companies working in every area you can imagine, biology touching food and drink, consumer products, healthcare, industrial chemicals, fuels, platforms. It's, there was over $1.3 billion invested in these companies by VCs last year alone. Some of my friends at MIT that helped get this stuff rolling went on and founded a company called Ginkgo Bioworks. It's one of the most successful. It's all robotic. Another company a little more recent is Zymergen. They're focusing on materials. Again, robots. You do not want people doing liquid management. If you can see the liquids that you're pipetting, you've got a million times too much. Yeah, and these block. robotic labs are now going cloud. This is a company called Transcriptic. It is a programmable laboratory in a shipping container. Eventually, it'll get smaller. It is so much fun doing this work because you can actually do state-of-the-art biotech from your living room. Yeah, okay. What role do you see ethical standards playing in nanotechnology, and, and what do you see as the key sort of safety issues to keep this very powerful technology safe? It's out of the bag. The terrorism. I think the first thing to observe is this is a very sophisticated technology that will be in the hands of governments, uh, corporations, uh, long before it's in the hands of, 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 of people who are, are in smaller groups and are uh, outside the, 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 the sphere of, of open uh, technology development and activity. At some point, though, powerful technologies, as we've seen, become, tend to diffuse, tend to become widely available. And there are often things that can be done with them that one very much wants to suppress. And I think that if we look at the future, where technologies are going, even without nanotechnology, just with Moore's Law progress, we're seeing a greater and greater density of sensors and communication systems. I think that the concern that people should have downstream a decade or two isn't that there will be terrorists uh, doing things that threaten them, but rather that systems that have been put in place to, among other things, suppress terrorism will have succeeded and may be used to suppress things that they would prefer not be to not be suppressed. So people are saying that terrorism will be a long open-ended war. If you look at this from the perspective perspective of technology, I think that even without nanotechnology, that we're moving toward a world of intensive network surveillance systems that will be able to suppress whatever people want to suppress. Uh, terrorism is very much a passing problem and that our concerns should be focused on how to manage the technologies that will make terrorism no longer be a problem, uh, how to deal with the world in which there is that degree of ability uh, to observe what people are doing and to control human action. And it is a free download on our website. Uh, it's called Mind Control uh, by Lincoln Lawrence, and it's uh, Were We Controlled? And um, I looked at this. This was written in the mid-60s. And uh, there, a Russian scientist is divulging the fact that they can use electrical impulses of any kind to influence human behavior. And he said, consider the, these revelations from a report titled The Effect of Electricity on the Human Body by the World Meteorological Organization. And this is what they say. Behavior. Traffic accidents.